Okay. Um, this is uh, midterm, practice midterm number three, uh, problem number one. And the problem is, below is the orbital energy diagram for nitrogen monoxide. Label the nitrogen atomic orbitals and the oxygen atomic orbitals. Place the valence electrons in the atomic orbitals and the molecular orbitals. Label the molecular orbitals. Draw a line showing the correlation between the atomic and molecular orbitals. Indicate the bond order and whether the molecule is diamagnetic or paramagnetic. And then you have a diagram like this uh, uh, for you to fill in. And this is a reasonably straightforward process. So the first thing we have to take into account when we do this is I have to determine which one of these set of atomic orbitals, which you can, we have a set of atomic orbitals on the left and on the right, which corresponds to nitrogen and which corresponds to oxygen. And this is pretty easily revealed when we take into consideration the amount of work that we would have to do to remove an electron from one of these orbitals. And, ta and then take into consideration <coughs> the electronegativity of the elements. And so the more electronegative element is going to be the one that's going to, you're going to, it's going to take more work to remove an electron from an, the more electronegative of the two elements. So it's, the more electronegative is going to be lower lying in energy. And so uh, this, these, this set of atomic orbitals lies lower in energy than this set of atomic orbitals. And so that means it would take more work to remove an electron from one of these orbitals than one these orbitals. So uh, uh, all we need to do to assign these labels is which is the more electronegative of the two atoms, nitrogen or oxygen. And we already know that that's oxygen. So the electronegativity increases as we go to the right and up. And oxygen being on the Pauling scale the second most electronegative element. Uh, second only to fluorine. So that means I can unambiguously place an oxygen here and a nitrogen there. And now, uh, now that I know this is nitrogen, I can place the electrons in the atomic orbitals. And so with nitrogen I have one, two uh, S electrons and one, two, three P electrons. We have five valence electrons of nitrogen. And with oxygen, I have six valence electrons, so I can place those in their respective orbitals. So now, having done that, let's uh, first I want to label the molecular orbitals that are going to arise, and the then I can draw the lines of correlation. So from the S combination. Uh, on both oxygen and nitrogen, I'm going to get with two, the, the note first that there is conservation of orbitals. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight atomic orbitals. And so the types of ways they can combine, the orbitals are going to be conserved. I'm going to get the same number of molecular orbitals. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight molecular orbitals. So from this combination of S orbitals, I'm going to get a bonding and an antibonding combination. And with S orbitals, the only possibility is a sigma type of a combination. So this is going to be my uh, sigma 2S combination and my sigma star 2S combination. And these are sigma orbitals. These, uh, uh, the sigma designation uh, denotes the fact that I have electron density in the molecular orbital that lies along the axis connecting the atoms. And we can draw pictures of that, but we don't need to here. Um, so the, uh, and the fact that it's a bonding orbital means that there's electron density 
that lies in the region between the two atoms. And the antibond combination denotes the fact that there's electron density that lies, um, is distributed exterior to the atoms, to, uh, but lies along the axis connecting them. And so, uh, and the node in the region between the atoms. So that is the antibonding combination. So I can now draw the lines correlating the uh, 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 molecular orbitals to their parent uh, atomic orbitals that, that we combine together in that fashion. Now, I have to deal with the p orbital and the p orbital combinations. Well, the p orbitals can combine in the same way. There can be bonding, anti-bonding, and even non-bonding combinations. And so I've got the pi combination where I've got the possibility of uh, uh, um, uh, 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 bonding and anti-bonding. And uh, that's going to arise when uh, the pi combination, uh, uh, I'll call this 2p, the pi 2p combination, the pi designation reflects the fact that uh, there is no electron density on the axis connecting the atoms. But the bonding combination arises when there is electron density in the region between the atoms, but uh, none uh, uh, you know, along the axis. So this is a pi combination. And then I also get the, uh, uh, the sigma type combination. And this would, this would be, we could basically make this out of the px and the py, and if we call the z-axis the axis connecting the atoms, this would be the sigma pz. So I can call I could I could further distinguish these as px and py and uh, uh, pz, but we don't need to go that far. I just need to recognize that this is a sigma, this is a pi combination, and this is a sigma combination, sigma 2p. It arises from the two p orbitals, so I can draw the lines connecting those as well, correlating. To the apparent, let me change this color here. The pi to p. And I can get the antibonding uh, orbitals correla the, uh, the corresponding to the pi interactions too. So I'll call this the pi star to p and the sigma star to p, which arise from combinations of the parent atomic. Uh, the the pure combination. So I draw the lines correlating those. And now I place the electrons in. And we do this the same way we did with the atomic orbitals when we were doing the electrons of the atoms themselves. Uh, I'm going to follow Hun's rule. And I've got 5 and 6, which is 11 electrons to place in. I'm placing them in the lowest energy first, one, two, three, four, well, let me change the color here, let make this a little clearer, one, two, three, four, five, six, now I can start to pair them up, seven, eight, So I place the 11 electrons in. And now we can take into account whether or not the, uh, 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 the molecule itself is diamagnetic or paramagnetic. And obviously, we've answered that question because I have an unpaired electron. So it is indeed paramagnetic. And I can, I can calculate the bond order. And the bond order is equal to one half the number of bonding electrons. And there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, minus the number of antibonding electrons, which is one, two, three. 
So that's equal to uh, five halves. So I have a bond order of five halves. And the beauty of molecular orbitals, you can have a half, uh, you can have a fractional bond order. And so we've determined the bond order, and there exists unpaired. Thank you.